What's up, everybody? We have a great show for you today. We have another guest. Sean is back on the podcast with us, which is awesome, too. We are going to be talking about missionaries and art and beauty and college campuses. I have no idea what's in store for this episode, but it is definitely going to be a good one with a new special guest. So definitely hang tight. All right, everybody, thank you again for downloading today's episode of the Just a Parishioner podcast. I'm Loren Zaragoza. I'm Sean Greeley. And we have a great show for you today. So again, we have a special guest coming on. But again, Sean wasn't here for the last episode. Great to have you back on, Sean. I missed it. I missed it dearly. It was an awesome episode. So I'm glad to to be back on for what I'm sure will be another awesome episode. Right. But that's because you were preparing for your trip to Ireland. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. So I was in Ireland for about a week. It was absolutely incredible. I would highly recommend everybody to go. And what's cool, like, I mean, we did my my bloodstream might have been like somewhat some percentage of Guinness the whole time I was there. You know, we were definitely <laughs> enjoying that, you know, very fresh. But outside of that and like the, you know, the, the medieval history and all that, there's like such a deep spirituality in that country. You just kind of feel it. And, you know, everywhere you go, there's like old like churches and hermitages and like the, the, you just learn so much history about how Western culture and like Christianity was really preserved in Ireland in a huge way. So it's just absolutely amazing to learn about all of that and just kind of revisit it in, so in, in a real way, but like physically being there. That's very cool. I, I mean, like uh, my wife and I, we went on our honeymoon there and it was an incredible time. And uh, my wife is, you know, she's a bunch of stuff, but mostly Irish um, and we're going around and it, it's so funny in during the entire trip, people are saying, Oh, I can tell you're Irish. I can tell by your brogue, like, like a little bit of a brogue there. And, uh, she does not have a brogue. I mean, you've spoken to my wife before. She doesn't really have a brogue, but somehow they could detect it. I did not have a brogue. Yeah. No, no, no. no. You didn't try to imitate like the lucky charms guy. <laughs> no brogue from Lorenz Zaragoza on our trip. But my wife did say that towards the end of the trip, I did have a brogue and that's appropriation. And I'm, and I'm sorry for that. Lorenz O. Zaragoza. <laughs> there you go. Um, please connect with us on social media at Just a Parishioner and Facebook.com slash Just a Parishioner. Very cool. While you were away in Ireland, we put up a website. We did. www.justaparishioner.com. Not I'm, that hard to memorize. Dude, I'm happy. Like I was typing it in and I'm like, oh man, if somebody took that domain name, I am going to be so <laughs> mad right now, but they didn't. Uh, so again, check us out there at www.justaparishioner.com. Dot com And again, subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and of course, you could watch us on YouTube. Now, let us get to our guest. She's been waiting there patiently as you and I banter on, and I apologize for that. So right now, we have Lisi Torres. Lisi, how are you? I'm good. How are you? We are doing well. So um, we're excited to have you on, Lisi. Um, we wanted to talk because, well, first off, you were a missionary over at Stony Brook University on Long Island. And actually, that's where you and I um, met through uh, a good friend, a mutual friend, Father Sean Magaldi. Um, so uh, before we dive into all that, just, you know, tell us what you're up to today and, and uh, what your background is a little bit. Yeah. So, I mean, today in general, um, I'm living in Virginia, in Vienna, uh, if- Fairfax County. And I just moved here a couple of weeks ago um, for two different really beautiful opportunities. Um, One is teaching art at a Catholic all girls school, which has been such a blessing. Um, I studied art education and art history. So getting to use um, my gifts in that way is definitely a delight. Um, But I'm also here to study uh, with an artist at Catholic University Um, so I just got back right before this podcast from my class, my night class that I'm taking there, um, which is truly a dream. It's, we're learning different drawing techniques, um, with the human figure, but through the lens of theology of the body. So there's a lot going on, a lot to learn. Um, but yeah, that's what I'm doing these days. I mean, that's all fresh right now. So we're definitely going to dive into that later on in the podcast. Um, so before, like, like I said, we, we, we do want to talk about, um, art, Catholic art specifically, um, the beauty of that. And I'm going to be very upfront, Lisi. I know nothing about it. Great. Um, great. So this is a great a teaching moment, <laughs> a great <laughs> learning moment for me. Um, Sean, what is your background when it comes to Catholic art? 
or art, um, in, art in general, actually. Well, yeah, art in general, uh, it's loose, but you know, I could probably <laughs> name like people like Michelangelo and Caravaggio, and then you okay. know, we'll, we'll leave it up to Lisi after that. Okay. <laughs> I'm, 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 you know, actually, so I'm curious, like. Have you ever heard of illuminated manuscripts before, Lucy? Yes. So that's yeah. something that I saw in Ireland. So we can maybe we could talk a little bit about that from like a medieval oh, art cool. perspective. Oh, I love that. Good, good. So uh, before we dive into that, um, I, I do want to hear about your background as a uh, missionary over at Stony Brook University. Yeah. How long were you there for? What was your experience like? What did you love about it? You don't oh have goodness. to tell us what you disliked about it, but if you <laughs> want to, you can. So uh, the floor is yours because I would love to hear Great. what you have to say about that uh, that time in your life. Wow. Yeah, I would love to talk about it. Stony Brook truly has such a special place in my heart. I don't even know where to begin. Um, yeah, I graduated from college in May of 2020. So graduated from my living room with my family, which was a blast. But um, when I graduated, I knew I was joining FOCUS uh, to be a campus missionary. And FOCUS stands for the Fellowship of Catholic University Students. So we uh, primarily focus on evangelizing on college campuses. And I was sent um, from my house in 2020, uh, found out that I was being sent to Stony Brook University, somewhere that I had barely heard of before, but I knew it was on Long Island. And again, had no idea what that was going to look like, but it ended up being one of the greatest gifts of my life. Um, Yeah, a few short months later, found myself moving to Long Island, July of 2020. And it was definitely a whirlwind, graduating, um, fundraising our salary uh, from home, and then joining a team of people, most of whom were strangers at the time, uh, to live in this little house on Long Island. But it was a beautiful experience. Um, Yeah, just got to spend two full years of my life, like being with people there and being with our students on campus. Um, And yeah, going to mass and praying with them, leading Bible studies, leading women in uh, discipleship, which is kind of like um, mentorship and just being a disciple of Jesus together. Um, but also getting to partake in a lot of retreats and a mission trip and just tons and tons of beautiful experiences that, um, not only was I serving, but every single moment God was pouring even more into me than I was giving to others. Um, I just received so much from my time there through friendship, through my teammates, um, the incredible other missionaries I got to work with who mean so much to me. Um, I got to work with two amazing priests Throughout my time, there was a transition from Father Lachlan Cameron my first year to Father Sean McGaldy my second, and both are great spiritual fathers to me. So uh, our wonderful campus ministers, I could just go on, but it was an incredible time, not only for me to get to know women and get to talk about Jesus all day, which was truly incredible, um, but also for Jesus to really be a missionary in my own heart and um, show me what needed uh yeah, what needed evangelizing within me and what needed to change and what needed uh, to be resurrected within me. So there was a lot that happened. I truly think I left Long Island a very different woman than the person that I arrived as, but all for the better. Um, Yeah, I truly think I've experienced like the deepest joy of my life there um, through just being with Jesus every day and my teammates. So yeah, it was I'm curious about like your perspective so you, you're from Philly, so you're not like completely yes. far into the Northeast, but the people yeah. I know that have done especially focus work in New Jersey and New York and particularly like the New York City metro area, which Long Island is being part of, oh you God. know, they've found it to be like, <laughs> I mean, it changes you in a good way, but it might be more of like a purifying by fire than it is anything oh, else. Yeah. So what, <laughs> oh, yeah. do you, what was your experience with that? Like how, how was the mission experience in that capacity? That's such an incredible question. I remember leaving Long Island after my first year and going to focus training that summer before starting my second year and people asking how my first year was. And I was like, the most purifying year of my life. (laughs) Um, Yeah, I think, so yeah, being from Philly, like sarcasm and, you know, people having walls up, that's not like foreign to me. Um, I've experienced that a lot, but something in particular about the hustle of like the New York area. And um, I noticed that a lot of people put their worth 
and productivity and um, like busyness and it's constantly like achievement, achievement, achievement. And where there are good things that come with being driven, um, it can be very difficult when we're putting our worth in what we're accomplishing. So I think something that was hard was like coming to New York, being totally new, it being a pandemic and finding that um, a lot of people that you meet just have a lot of walls up. There's a lot of um, not wanting to show emotion because emotions, like there's like the lie that emotions make you weak or like even just practically speaking, like people being so busy that it's truly difficult to like make the time to get to know each other. Um, And for sure, like as a missionary, we were incredibly busy as well. But um, I think that was something that I was surprised by when I first arrived was how much it took to, um, yeah, just find the time or find a space to get to know people or like how long it takes for people to trust you. And um, that's not all to say, like, I, I truly love the people that I met there so deeply and I'm so grateful for them. Um, but I think, yeah, being a missionary in New York, it's just aside from like the people I was directly working with the, the culture, it's not a Christian culture. Um, like you, you could get sent as a missionary to a different part of the country where people say like, God bless when you leave a restaurant. Um, but like, that's not going to happen in New York. And, um, that's yeah, kind of what I've always thought about it not to cut you off, but it's like, yeah you might be in an area where Catholicism isn't as big as it is in the Northeast, like cultural Catholicism and family Catholicism. But unfortunately, most people, I think if you are in like the cultural Catholicism, it's like, yeah, we we go to mass like twice or three times a year and we don't really talk about it otherwise. Whereas to your point in other parts of the country, even if they're like a Protestant or some other denomination, they probably talk very openly about their faith. And if they are Catholic, then it's probably the same thing. You know, it's, it's a normal thing to share about. Yeah, if I could piggyback on what Sean was saying, because um, I think that, you know, I'm always like thinking, you know, what if I lived in a different part of the country that that valued God a little bit more and, and, and valued Catholicism a little bit more? But there is something gratifying about having that challenge in front of you and trying to knock down those walls. And, and believe me, uh, I, I think that people in other parts of the country have a different evangelization uh, hurdle mm-hmm. to get over, especially oh, yeah. in the Bible Belt when you're talking about, you know, trying to convert more Protestants as opposed to trying right. to uh, bring atheists uh, closer to God. So it, it's a completely different realm. Yeah. Uh, but there is something that that I enjoy about, you know, the challenge of, hey, listen, I, I've got, I'm going to live here my entire life. I'll I'll say two words today. I'll say ten words tomorrow. I'll say I'll I'll say more paragraphs down the road, and just take my time and and work on your soul while I work on mine. You know what I'm yeah. saying? So I I get it. Challenges and gifts for sure. Yeah, I definitely saw both of those sides of um the beautiful parts of that where like we had students um converting to Catholicism, not even just having like a reconversion, but truly like converting and receiving sacraments, and it's almost like um, once people are bought in and they find the truth, they're like, this is incredible. Like I, I need this. Um, but it takes, yeah, it just takes more time. I think for people to trust or to even get used to talking about the faith, like they've just never had an opportunity to do that. Um, but I definitely saw the beautiful things in, um, yeah, it like taking time, but then people getting ready to also like fight for the faith, um, somewhere where it's not as, as, normal or typical. Um, but then, yeah, they're also like the hardships. So I think there's, there's beauty in it all. And I think there can be a temptation, um, to say like, Oh, if I was placed somewhere else or like somewhere else, it's going to be better. Like the grass is always greener, but like mission is mission, like no matter where you are. And there's, there's a cross in it anywhere. Um, I found Stony Brook to be particularly beautiful for me. And I knew Jesus wanted me there in particular, like there's no other campus that he wanted me to serve on. Um, Because first, I think my experience in Philly, like prepared me to be a missionary in New York. It wasn't like I was going from the Midwest or the South to New York. Like I was more used to the culture. Um, But also when I arrived at Stony Brook, there were only focused missionaries there for two years prior. So, um, 
they had focused missionaries for about a year and a half and then it was the COVID shutdown. Mm -hmm. So there were two women, um, serving before my teammate Megan and I served as the female missionaries. And we learned so much from them. They passed on some really beautiful knowledge. And I know they planted a lot of seeds on that campus or Jesus planted seeds through them, but getting to be there in the early stages was exactly like the type of mission that my heart loves. Um, like really doing outreach and like meeting new people, um, constantly like trying to start new Bible studies rather than continuing old ones all the time. There was something really beautiful about that, that my heart I think was crafted for in serving. Whereas if I were sent to a very established focus campus, I would have mostly been working with student leaders who are the ones going out and starting the new Bible studies and new, um, events and new small groups. So there's beauty in both in every type of mission, every campus is different. Um, but I found that the type of mission my heart was made for was what I received at Stony Brook. It was, um, yeah, it was a school in New York. It was somewhere that hadn't had a ton of focused missionaries before. Um, it was, I was meant to be there in the middle of a pandemic. Like God wanted me there then. Like otherwise he would have sent me at a different time. So yeah, there were just a lot of really intentional things um, that I never would have expected that came, that became clear over time. So, yeah. It's like, uh, I'm thinking about like the Jesuits in the 1500s who could have been at like a cushy little place in like Italy or France, but then they all went to, or like the handful who went to East Asia and they were all persecuted, you know, not to call New York like a persecuting place, but (laughs) it's, it's not, but it's uh, like you could go to a very comfortable place or you could go to a place that isn't quite as comfortable, but there's still like absolutely incredible evangelization work to be done there. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. And it was interesting too. Stony Brook being a STEM heavy school, like a lot of the women, um, I never expected to learn so much about the MCAT. Like <laughs> until I arrived at Stony Brook and all these like working with people in engineering and medicine and um, business compared to my undergrad where there were a lot of more humanities and artists around me. So that was also interesting to bring my, um, different temperament to, to the community, but. Completely different sides of the brain at that point. I mean, that's, that's what you're working with there. Um, honest question here, which chaplain did you like better? Oh my God. I'm just, no, I'm just kidding. I'm, I'm not going to ask. Gonna we ask. love them both equally, but we are going to ask you to choose a favorite. No, no, no. I'm joking around uh, there. Um, absolutely not. Don't even answer that question. Um, but, for, you know, before we wrap up, I mean, I'm sure that, you know, you'll have times that you can interject what you experienced with what we're about to talk about next. But is there anything that you wanted to um, wrap up in regards to your time at Stony Brook University? Yeah, I just don't think I'll ever truly be able to communicate like how much I received in giving God like a yes to serving for two years. Um, First, like how much I received from the Lord, but also like how much joy I received from the people. And I don't think I'll ever be able to like thank the people that I met there and got to walk with there and got to know and love. I don't think I'll ever truly be able to thank them enough. Um, yeah, the joy and the beauty, I, I can't even describe. Um, I can't describe it well because it, it's just beyond words. Um, but I think something I would say is if there is anyone who is like nervous to give God a yes to something crazy or what seems crazy or different or out of your life plan, like if you give God your yes, he's going to give you a hundred times more. Um, and yeah, I just, I don't know. I never expected to be where I am and I know God used it so much and I just received so much. So just a quick word of encouragement to anyone that is, <laughs> who might I mean, be discerning mission work or something like that. I mean, I feel like that's every evangelization effort, you know, like what is, yeah. what is God calling you to do at that point? Um, but you know, specific to the missionary work, I mean, you did it right after you graduated undergrad and yeah. I mean, not that there's a, a better time or a worse time, but if I were to pick a perfect time, it's before you start your quote unquote career, uh, mm-hmm. because it's, 
you know, before you jump into the, I guess, the working field, it, it's much harder to break out of it, um, yeah. especially when you are starting a family, if that's what God, God's calling you to do. Or I know a lot of uh, missionaries go into uh, the seminary. And if, if, if that's the case, then obviously you need to do your mission work prior to that. So um, I'll say this, though, like I, I used I mean, I remember being an undergrad and like thinking about doing something besides going into career time like after college and maybe you can relate to it Lisa like at that moment you feel like there's so much pressure to just start the next stage of your life yeah and that, like you just think it's supposed to be this traditional like okay I got yeah. my degree and now I need to go get a paycheck and I need to work for the next 40 years like that's just what it is you know <laughs> um and I remember I mean I went I went to seminary briefly um uh, and I remember in that at that time like while I was in like looking at friends who like got well-paying jobs out of college and you're just like, man, I feel like I'm falling behind somehow. And it does take this like crazy radical trusting God to even just move beyond that mentally at yeah. that time, which I mean, a hundred percent, like you're right. Like that is the best time to do it. But in that moment, it's very difficult, but that's just like, I, I think both of us can say like all the respect in the world to the people who make the decision to like, find that take the time to discern that God is leading them in that direction and then give them like that. Yes. That you and all the other missionaries and you know, anybody else who's pursuing a vocation does like God, God bless everyone who does that. It's it's really an yeah. incredible thing. Amen. Yeah, absolutely. I completely agree. Like it definitely, um, could, yeah, I, I mean, I think it, it was easier for me to go in right from college than people who I know who left full-time salary jobs to then join focus. Um, but yeah, at the same time, like telling people like, no, I'm, I'm going to freeze my teaching certification. Like I'm not going to pursue what I just spent a lot of time and money studying for four years. Mm -hmm. Um, I did get a lot of like, Oh, <laughs> a lot of interesting reactions. So, um, I'm not going to go teach. I'm not going to make any money. Also, could you Can donate you to my salary? Give me <laughs> right. money. Thank you. <laughs> it is tax deductible, but please give me your donation. Yeah, exactly. Well, anybody anybody listening that is looking for a good organization to donate to outside of your local parish, like go to focus.org. Because I know there's always missionaries who are struggling oh, with yeah. fundraising and they would love if you can throw them even like twenty dollars a month. Something Seriously. something as little as that. Yeah, this podcast so you know, sponsored by Stony Brook University and Focus. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Focus better share this. Yeah, Focus better real. share this. <laughs> I'm out here doing free fundraising for it. No, for real. Um, but no, first off, thank you for sharing your time because I, I, you and I have been going back and forth offline and, and that's, I wanted to hear, like you and I met for a little bit. I wanted to hear your perspective on it and your story and, you know, our, you know, our mutual friend, the chaplain over at Stony Brook, actually currently Father Sean Magaldi, he had the world to say about you. I mean, you know, oh. he, he loved his time with you and and he's like, you, you gotta, you gotta have her on the podcast. I think she's got a lot of beautiful things to share. So, wow. um, that's phenomenal. So, and speaking <laughs> of beauty, you see that transition, Sean, nice. speaking of beautiful and beauty, <laughs> um, let's, let's go into, um, essentially your passion, like, like what you studied, what your career is now. And yeah. if you could dive a little bit more into the next phase of your life, essentially. Yeah. Oh my gosh. It's so surreal. Um, it's so good for me to talk about to even process it, but yeah. So I departed from Long Island at the end of May and, uh, moved some stuff back home to the Philly area and, um, pretty much was using like my parents' house as storage for a lot of the summer, um, came home and then pretty soon after hopped on a plane to, study sacred art and renaissance oil painting at the sacred art school in florence italy and that was a huge huge blessing honestly a dream come true um to pursue sacred art i've always been an artist um ever since yeah i can remember i've been an artist i think god just crafted my heart in this way um but even in focus um tried, tried my best, uh, to continue to pursue my artwork, um, as a missionary. And there were a lot of challenges that came with that. But when I was discerning leaving focus at the end of my two years, I knew, okay, the Lord is asking me to dive deep and open my hands and not grasp at, um, creating my own plans or, um, yeah, controlling what my next step looks like, but really trying 
trust him and and take a risk here. So I had heard of the Sacred Art School years ago, had always had my eye on it, and uh, had the blessing of uh, being accepted to their summer program where I was there for about five weeks um, in July, most of July and a bit of June. And um, yeah, spent like every day pursuing what I love, which is drawing and painting, uh, but through a Catholic perspective, which is something I'd never experienced before. Um, and it was a beautiful time in Italy. I learned so much, but um, I had discerned that like my summer there was the, uh, yeah, my summer there was beautiful, but God was um, inviting me to come back home afterwards. So I came back home, I knew in August, and I knew that um, pursuing my career as a sacred artist is what God was calling me to do. John Paul II's letter to artists has really inspired me time and time again, where it's it's pretty much like calling artists higher and asking us to really dive in and dive deep and use our gifts for the church. Um, so I knew I wanted to do that, but I had no idea how God was going to provide opportunities to keep learning. Um, I could talk about this for hours, but opportunities to keep learning because I think a lot of contemporary art schools uh, lack a lot of foundational uh, skills in terms of anatomy and realism. Um, so I knew I wanted to keep learning, wanted to keep creating, um, but I also knew that 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 doing that full-time just wasn't feasible off the bat. Um, so, so, so if I can, if I could jump in here, uh, yeah. in there with a question, um, again, you're talking about somebody who's never studied, uh, you know, a minute of art in his entire sure. life. <laughs> sure. Um, but if you can, if you could break down what, what you think the difference between just art in general and the beauty of just traditional art and, and Catholic art and distinguish, you know, what, what you feel the difference is between the two of those, or how would you describe that? Yeah, that is an incredible question that I've actually been pondering and haven't totally found the answer to. Um, because I think any art, I mean, any art created by a Catholic should be Catholic art. And it doesn't need to be explicit at all. But, um, you know, our first identity is being a son and daughter of God and being a Catholic. Um, and then comes my role as an artist. So like I, I'm a landscape painter at times and I, I truly believe that every single one of my landscape paintings, um, is a Catholic work of art because it's inspired by God, the father. Um, however, I think there is a much, a more clear line between, there is a very clear line between art and liturgical art or sacred art. So, um, liturgical or sacred art um, I might botch the definition, but pretty much, um, it's always meant to point, point our gaze towards the divine. Um, and it's never meant to glorify the artists themselves. It's never mm. meant to glorify any human being, but truly meant to point our gaze towards God. So, um, yeah, like sacred art is the Pieta, you know, like it is, it is Mary holding her, her son, um, things like that. So if it's pointing our gaze towards God, then it's sacred art. Um, otherwise it is art that might have Catholic components. It might have Catholic themes. It might be made by a Catholic, but, um, sacred art in itself is really all about where is our gaze pointed to. Um, and something that I've really thought about lately is that calling something sacred art, um, we shouldn't use that phrase lightly. Um, mm. if we're going, yeah, if we're going to glorify God, um, it takes a lot of intentionality, but yeah, I'm very much continuing to ponder this question because, um, yeah, being something I've thought a lot about and that my current teacher is speaking about very often is, um, that in order to be a sacred artist or a liturgical artist, you really, really, really need to fight for it. You need to train very hard and long. And um, it's an honor. It's a calling. It's truly a calling. Um, and like John Paul II uses the term, like it's a vocation, like the vocation of an artist. Um, obviously not like the capital V vocation, but 
it's very much a calling. So to anyone who doesn't know a lot about art, I'd say if, if you really feel pulled towards God, when you're looking at something, then it can be called sacred. I think like, I'm, th- I'm just listening to you talk and like the difference you said, even between like you're a landscape artist and you might paint a landscape that's showing like a field or mountains or something to that degree. Mm-hmm. I would imagine that's what you're talking about. Um, and in that, like a hundred percent, like you have this installation of like trying to, trying to portray grace through like a natural landscape. But mm-hmm. then, yeah, when you paint something like very clearly Christian, it's going to be a little bit different. And right. I, I, you tell me what you think about this. Like, first of all, the, the sculpture of David, that was Michelangelo, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah so, Oh, look at you, I man. There, there we go. I'm just put another pin on the board for my art knowledge. Um, Seven points to Sean Greeley. Nice. But like, I think about like that and it's like this, almost like impossible rendition of the human form that we have as an example from the, like the Renaissance time. And like, you look at that and you can seriously ponder, like how can something so perfect be created out of a block of marble? Mm -hmm. And that Mm -hmm. can lead you down. Maybe partially what Michelangelo was trying to do is like, allow you to think about like, you look at yourself and the people around you and you're like, how can something so perfect be in existence like in this 3d world that I'm in, you know, as, as a human being like this perfectly like functioning machine or anatomy or whatever you refer to it as. So that's one thing like that's Michelangelo and you can ponder that and you can like pray and meditate on that. But then you have something like Michelangelo's Sistine chapel painting, the roof of the Mm -hmm. Sistine chapel. And you're like the ceiling. And it's like, that's very clearly, I think, maybe that sacred liturgical art that you're talking about where it's like, you know, it's supposed to like literally draw you into the heavenly just by gazing upon it. Yeah. Oh my gosh. This could be like an entire PhD because um, when you think about Michelangelo's David, like that is an old Testament story of like David and Goliath. Um, So is that Catholic art? Like that could be a whole conversation in itself. Um, But yeah, like, I I would agree that when, for me personally, when I think of the Sistine Chapel, I'm like, amen, sacred art right there. And when I think of David, I think that's kind of more of that in between of, um, yeah, it's, it's, I wouldn't say it's instantly pointing me to the divine but I could also be convinced that it is. So that's a little more gray. Um, I'll leave that to the art student over here. Yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah. So yeah, that's some, that's some great knowledge you're bringing to the table. That's awesome. Man, I'm impressed. I'm impressed with you, Sean. Let's see what stuff, else I can man. throw out there. Yeah. Well, I have a more basic question for you. Actually, it's, sure. I don't know. You, you tell me if it's a basic question or not, Lisi, because when we're talking about art, and I'm not just talking about, you know, the type of art we're talking about, I'm talking about like music, I'm talking okay. about um, yep. film. And when you call something, you know, I was listening to Bishop Barron talk about this. When you call something Catholic, whatever, mm-hmm. the the question you have to ask is what is being sacrificed when we call something Catholic, whatever? Because very few times are, are we able to see something Christian or Catholic, especially when it comes to film or music and say, this is great. It's clearly intended to bring me closer to God, but I feel like they're, they're kind of shoving something down my throat, right? I feel Mm. like they're, they're pushing something onto me right now. And believe me, it doesn't just happen with Christian and Catholic art. This happens on the opposite side of it. A lot of secular stuff where we're watching something on TV and we're like, man, I would love if you were just entertain me right now, as opposed to pushing this message, whatever yeah. message it is, pushing this message on me because you're losing me now. Yeah. Now I've lost yeah. you. And that's not exclusive. Like, so that's what I mean. Like, so like, where, where does it fall where, all right, I'm trying to create this sacred piece right now. I'm trying to create this sacred art, but at the sacrifice of what? Like, is it beautiful because it's just beautiful or is it beautiful because it, it's quote unquote Catholic or sacred or liturgical? So if you could speak to that. Woo. This is so great. Yeah. Um, yeah. So 
Okay, I'm sorry. Can you repeat the question? I'm just so caught up in all of this. I don't even know what think, the question let, was, let me, Lisa. Let me try to break it. I think I think I, I think where Lorenz landed was is something is Catholic art beautiful because it's Catholic, or is it beautiful in and of itself with beauty as its own category? Yeah. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Sure. And then and then Great. and then part B of that is how can a Catholic artist not fall into the trap of creating yeah. something Catholic just to be Catholic? Yes. Great, great question. So something that it's uh, a teacher of mine said that I've thought a lot about is that he doesn't appreciate the phrase Catholic artist because it feels a bit like propaganda mm. to him. Um, and I've reflected on that a lot because that's usually what I would identify as is a Catholic artist because first I'm Catholic and then I'm an artist. Um, but honestly, I think this just all comes back to like intention. And for me, um, when I am creating for the past two, for the past three years, I would say when I create a work of art, 90% of the time, the image has come to me in prayer. And that isn't, um, yeah. And I don't know. I don't know what all Catholic, other Catholics who are artists are doing in terms of their process that leads them to create a work of art, whether that be music, film, uh, visual arts, et cetera. But I think that in terms of that discomfort of, oh, this like feels a little like forced. Um, I think it really does go back to intention where it's, am I creating this um, to kind of like check the boxes and make it appeal to my viewers who are Catholic, or is it because this idea has truly come, uh, from the Holy spirit, from the Lord. And I just desire to glorify God. And I guess both of those things can be happening. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think this, honestly, this type of question, I think is very difficult to address. And I try to address it very gently because I know that the vast majority of people creating artwork, whether it feels forced or it feels very natural, all have good intentions. And I never, um, yeah, I, I never want to assume intention. Um, I think at times artwork can feel forced when, for me, and this is for me only, um, artwork can feel forced when it feels like it's being churned out, um, for the sake of keeping an audience captivated. And I think that often happens due to our fast paced instant gratification, social media culture, where because of the Instagram algorithm or like other things going on, we feel like we need to constantly be producing. And that's when it's like, okay, well, what idea can I like hurry up and come up with? Versus like, okay, wait, I need to ponder. I need to stop, slow down, like ask the Holy Spirit, how do you want to use my gifts? And that's personally just my experience because there have been times where I have been incredibly tempted to move in the direction of, I need to produce more. I need to produce faster. I need to keep my audience engaged or, oh no, I'm going to lose them. And then what? Um, so I think that's something that I have thought a lot about since um about a year and a half ago is when I really started to share my art with the world um on different social media platforms because before I kept a lot of my artwork very private um it yeah and then I just felt called to share so since then I've thought a lot about like okay I need to slow down I need to ponder my intentions I need to ponder my concepts and um things like that so yeah I think it's um I think it really goes back to the artist in terms of asking the question of, is this, uh, like feeling forced, like, is this forced, is this organic, um, questions like that. So as you're talking, something that comes to mind for me, like we have, um, one of our mutual friends works in music production for a Christian artist, um, and is working with kind of like an up and coming Christian artist and trying to help him like popularize and everything. Mm -hmm. And he writes this awesome, really, really, really good music that is 
like incredible and very much seemingly ordained by God, right? In mm-hmm. some capacity, right? Like is is really communicating a great message, but like he's trying to get on the radio to get big so that his music can make it out there. And I think we, at least I've heard like he hasn't put out a radio song, like a song that's going to appeal to the masses in a way that it's mm. like, this is something I'm, I'm going to love. And I'm thinking about that and kind of thinking about what you just said and like some of the stuff that I've liked and like some of the stuff that has been really become almost like part of the, the Christian canon or the Catholic canon of art. And mm-hmm. I'm thinking about like art, you know, authors like Flannery O'Connor, right. Or, or mm-hmm. Tolkien who wrote Lord of the Rings. And like these people wrote like almost subversive Catholicism into their literature that they were writing much in the same way that Christ was kind of subversive coming into the world and kind of snuck up on people. And <laughs> like, there might be something to that where it's like the, like the, the real stuff that can really like affect change and affect people's hearts might be the stuff that isn't as obvious or as like immediately pleasurable in the same way that like yeah. you're just looking for like that same pattern that's going to sell an album or the same pattern that's going to sell a book or something like that right yeah I think that's something that is a very difficult dilemma that artists face often and I have talked to multiple other artists musicians you know the general arts about this because um yeah like in terms of making a living it's it's hard it's like I'm not a full-time studio artist and um it takes time to get there and it's like okay like should I try and get on the radio so that I have the income so that I can like quit my day job so I can continue to ponder these things and create more like ordained music or works of art or whatever and that's like a very difficult um dilemma that I think a lot of people face um yeah and is it's I was just speaking to someone about this today actually um how I'm trying to be very prudent in what I'm um sharing because I recently um like for example I recently designed journals with my artwork on them and I like them and they're pretty but at the same time I'm like, okay, I like these. However, my end goal is to be a fine artist. So how do I balance this like instant $10 I can make versus like my long-term goal of being a fine artist and balancing like, where is my time going? Where are my resources going? All of these things. It's just a very tricky dilemma. And, you know, no one's path is going to be the same. So um, yeah, it's kind of, it's kind of tough to say what people should do in these situations because it really varies. So, so it, I'm sorry, did you want to? Well, no, I was just going to say, I think, you know, what you said before, Lisey, is like you you take time to try to pray and discern what, what God is leading you. Like you said, like 90% of your art has come, in from, has come from prayer. Mm-hmm. And I think that if people can give their time to prayer, like God's not going to steer you wrong if you're genuine in your prayer and you're, you know, take time to discern that what is coming to your heart is truly coming from God and, isn't some kind of other spiritual force and like that should steer you in the right direction, you know, most of the time. Yeah. Yeah, I I have a, I mean, speaking to that, I have a very tough time doing that when it comes to discerning. I mean, I'm I'm sure I'm not alone with that. I'm I'm speaking very confidently, but (laughs) (laughs) because I I mean, I'll, I'll try to take the time to, to pray on like, what do you, what do you want for me in this portion of my life? What do you want for me here? And I listen, right? I'm putting that in quotes. I listen. And then I kind of, uh, I kind of go back. I'm like, am I just listening to my own thoughts? Am I listening to what I want to hear? And, and, and that's a, you know, a easier thing to say than do. Uh, but I think you're right. Genuine in your prayer and, and, and doing it more often. And you're not going to get an answer the first time you pray. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that's, yeah. that's, that's tough. That's tough. And I'm imagining that's a, kind of what you're you're torn with also but um if you could actually speak to like it's outside of your quote unquote career or your job right now but you're you're also s- focusing on your own artwork as well yes. and you have your own venture going praise on as god. well yes praise god yeah um sorry was there a question or no that? no see i keep, <laughs> tell us I about keep, it lisi i keep talking 
and not actually asking a question. So no, my question great. is if you could actually speak more to, sure. you know, what, oh, what you're to. trying to do from, from that perspective of your own yeah. personal artwork. Wow. This is such an honor to have a chance to speak about this. Um, yeah. Praise God. It's been, it's been an adventure and it is something that I never, ever, ever expected my life to lead me to because I am one who has loved safety and predictability. And this is the least predictable career path I could have taken, (laughs) but all that to say, um, my personal art, um, yeah, it's, it's in a very, uh, I would say almost like contemplative season, maybe. Um, yeah, where I have, I spent the summer, like I was saying in Italy, um, studying and really thinking about, okay, has my art, this has been a huge question for me, has my art gone in the direction that it has due to my lack of training in technique because modern art schools are often moving away from traditional technical teaching styles to abstract, contemporary, um, less structured styles. To be clear by that, you mean like throwing paint out of canvas and being like, look at that, it's art. I mean, you could say that. Um, and I, <laughs> and I loved my undergrad. I loved what I learned. I learned a lot about how to control oil paint, how to work with oil paint. Um, however, I did, um, yeah, I did find that in terms of understanding the human figure, I lacked knowledge about that. So my art kept moving in this direction where I was um, using, um, yeah, I was doing a lot of landscape, which I still love, but I also was kind of using more abstract figures, not because I necessarily wanted to, but because I truly didn't know how human anatomy functioned. Um, so that's what the main reason that I went to Italy, um, was to learn that the school I went to was very technical. It was a Renaissance style school. It was very much focused on the human form. Um, And when I came back, I was like, oh my goodness gracious, I just learned so much. Like I am hungry to keep learning. I need to keep growing in this. So I think recently my art practice has had a lot of changes happening because I'm in a season where I'm very much learning. Like these days I'm drawing a lot of, um, yeah, a lot of figures working with models in my course and a lot of studying skeletons and muscle and their placement and how they interact with one another. So I'm not painting a lot these days, which is very hard for me, but it's, it's good for me to go back to the basics. Um, but anyway, I'll have to say my art practice, I'm an oil painter. I love oil painting. Um, I've always loved to paint, but I started using oils my sophomore year of college and have just never picked up another type of paint since I just love it. Um, it creates such beautiful color and texture and vibrance and life. Um, I don't see myself really steering in any other direction. Um, but what's a, what's a good example of like a famous oil painter? Was that this kind of stuff that was used in like the Renaissance or is this? More yeah. Of like a, really yeah. Like a- so most of the paintings we think of are most likely oil. If you're thinking of like a church painting where it's probably a little faded, that's like, um, fresco tempera but um those like vibrant like caravaggio like that is oil um yeah so pretty much the lord has just invited me to keep diving deeper and deeper into my gifts as an artist and that's where i've been learning a lot but i've also been creating a lot um and yeah it began, I really began diving into like my independent art practice as Elisa Maria Torres, my full name, um, two years ago. And, um, yeah, my dear friends in New York, uh, from art house to be there in Manhattan, uh, they put together really cool Catholic art shows and events for Catholic creatives. And, one of my friends who runs it um, invited me to bring some paintings to one of the shows and hang them. And at this point um, it was October, my first year as a missionary, I hadn't picked up a paintbrush in like five months and I was aching (laughs) because I just didn't know how to juggle being a missionary and being an artist and um, her inviting me to that and asking me to bring my art and share my art again and be in an environment with other creative people after being 
spending past month at a STEM school um, really reignited that fire as an artist for me. And from then on, I said, okay, I'm sitting down and looking at my schedule. I'm carving out art time. I'm exploring, Lord, now that I'm away from my university where I had all these assignments, like, what do you want me to create? Like, what, what, who am I as an artist? What does my art practice look like now that I'm not just completing assignments? Um, and it began with a lot of, um, yeah, I did an image of divine mercy with Jesus. And I had a painting of Our Lady of Guadalupe um, and was just kind of contemplating what does it, again, asking that question, like, what does it mean to be a Catholic and an artist? And how as a missionary am I an artist? And how am I actually a missionary of beauty in this world? Which is a question I ask myself every day is like, what does it mean to be a missionary of beauty? Um, I've, and, never, I've never heard that phrase before. Oh my until gosh. Until you it's just my said that. New favorite phrase. I, I personally, like rather than saying I'm a Catholic artist, I say I'm a missionary of beauty. I think our world lacks beauty so much. We have so many like, images constantly thrown in our face throughout the day, whether that be through like advertisements and our phones and like just constantly being on screens and like the visual noise in our lives is so intense. But are we ever looking at things that are truly like good and beautiful? Um, so I believe that I'm a missionary of beauty, that I am being called to bring authentic beauty rooted in truth into the world. Um, and that is just a question where I asked Jesus, like, how do you want me to do this? And um, right now as an artist, the reason, one of the reasons why I'm going back to the basics, back to drawing, back to the figure, I'm literally like studying, hanging up pictures of skeletons in my studio space, like studying bone structure hmm. is because if I'm going to attempt to be a sacred artist, the Lord only deserves the best. Like, he only deserves my best abilities. Like if I need to spend a year and I'm not sharing a ton of my paintings with the world because I'm studying and I'm growing and I'm building that foundation, then like, what is a year? If it means that the next 50 years of my life, I can, I'm mean, God willing, I can make sacred, like truly sacred art. Um, so that's the direction my art practice is going in is um, really yeah, really trying to like step up my game and like, yeah, like ask for help. And like, I have two mentors in my art practice at the moment. Um, one is more like the theoretical, where am I going? And the other is my teacher who I'm learning so much from my teacher, uh, Joni McManus, who's truly incredible. And uh, he weaves in theology of the body into the human figure during every one of our classes. And I'm just, I'm, I've never learned so much in one class in my life, but I want to, um, can, I, can I pause you for a second? Yeah. Cause you just said something theology of the body, um, around your art classes. And yeah, like, I, I forget oh if we've talked about theology of the body in prior times. episodes, I think it's come up a few times and yeah. it's like, can you just explain, like, I mean, you've, you brought up like beauty and you've brought up your art and you brought up, you just brought up theology of the body. Like how do those things all kind of intertwine? Yeah. Obviously like you're spending a lot of time studying human anatomy so that you can reflect that in your artwork. Like right. what is, what is, how do those things kind of come together? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So the connection between, I mean, beauty captivates us, whether that is through music, painting, a film that tells a beautiful story, like beauty, beauty in itself is, a transcendental. It is a way that God is communicating with us. It is God himself in its truest form. Um, and beauty's connection to art is that art that is, yeah, art that is beautiful, again, like draws us to God. Um, but in terms of art and theology of the body, which is very much something that is uh, new to me as well, um, is that the theology of the body is meant, is the theology of the body goes back to John Paul II, and it goes back to his teachings on the dignity of the human person. Um, so the connection between the dignity of the human person and art is that how can art reflect um, our dignity? And is the art that we're creating reflecting human dignity? And in particular, in this course and in the art world, um, someone who's studying anatomy like me is working with many models um, 
models who are like not clothed. And the discussion of theology of the body with that is we live in a fallen world. We're all fallen. Um, however, God created the human form beautiful, like truly beautiful. And in order to depict, um, to depict any human in it's in like our best ability, we need to understand the anatomy of the human form. And an artist studying anatomy is just as important as a doctor studying anatomy, things like that, where it is like, it is to form our mind academically, but also it's like, we are understanding like my, the model that I'm working with isn't just model number seven. It's, it's, there's dignity to the person standing in front of me and my artwork should be glorifying their own dignity. So the theology of the body is all about the di dignity of the human person. Um, it is about human sexuality. It's a lot about, um, yeah, just what we're made for and how our fallen world has uh, distorted our view of sexuality and our view of our bodies um, and the beauty of our bodies. So all that to say, um, my art being connected to theology of the body is pretty much me under learning to understand what we're truly made for and how we are made and how we are made beautiful. Um, and how can I, as an artist, show my viewers, like, or invite my viewers to contemplate beauty and humanity and the dignity of the person that they're looking at. So it's a very um, complex, it's simple, but it's complex. And it's definitely high level discussions in, in the, um, in like the Catholic art world, you could say. Um, yeah. I think like I will, part, part of why I piqued my interest, I guess, was kind of like the whole, like, I mean, you see all, a lot of like Renaissance age or like even pre Renaissance age paintings that do depict the body in like nudity, right. Whether it's mm -hmm. male or female. And it's like, you look at that and you don't see it as, I mean, a lot of people do like see it in an immature light and like, Oh, this is like, they view it in like a strictly sexual way. And oftentimes mm -hmm. like an, an appropriate sexual way. But I think most people, and especially like a mature view of that would be like, this is like an, a cool, like a I'll say cool because I'm in the 21st century, but like a beautiful representation of like um, humanity and kind of in the sense that you're talking about it in like a more reverent, way that you can yeah. approach it and the theology of the body like I, I love looking into that with jp2 but it's crazy just how things were skewed so far over the last hundred plus years where you know everything sexual is now pornographic and like the word erotic was turned to be, be used in that way whereas like the the form of love eros was like a greek archetype yeah. of love you know so there's like such a skewing of things over time and it's cool to hear it being taught in a way now that's kind of like reclaiming the human form and the human body as something sacred that can be presented yeah. in art in that way and, and the dignity of the body as well i mean because that's you know just to piggyback off of what you're saying and you were talking about the stem world right so uh, i happen to work in the medical field as well mm -hmm. and for training purposes we use cadavers right and what are cadavers cadavers are you know people people who who have died and donated their bodies to you know to to help physicians you know surgeons practice their technique to help better themselves right and better humanity and more times than not We'll walk into a cadaver lab and and not even blink twice. You know, <laughs> we'll we'll say, okay, time to get to work, right? Um, and that that was in the old field I was in. The cadavers were actually there were no heads. It was just honestly from shoulder, it was torso, essentially. Wow. But now I'm working in a different field where it's it's you know breastbone and up, and faces, and we 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 cover the faces prior to working, but only recently since we started working cadavers like this is it has it kicked in. I'm like, man, this is. This is somebody, this is a person, this is somebody's, yeah. you know, son, daughter, uh, you know, parent, cousin, uh, friend, and and only recently, and and, and I, I, I hate myself for it, where I'm like, no, this is an actual person. So me and another co Catholic colleague of mine, you know, we, we try to be very cognizant of that when we walk into a cadaver lab and say, like, listen, let, let, I know it might be weird, it might make people uncomfortable, but I don't care, let's and we, we don't need to be out, out and about with it, but let's say a quick prayer, at least to ourselves, you know, yeah. uh, for, for, for this person. And, and 
to save essentially their dignity. Hmm. Um, yeah. So, you know, it's like I said, art, the STEM world, you know, it, it's all the theology of the body. It's all regarding that dignity of, of that, of that right. human form, that person, you know? Um, and just to, um, you know, to, to put a bow on things, Lisey, and, and again, I'm not trying to rush conversation because we could talk for the mm-hmm. next 45 minutes if you have a lot more to say. Um, but we're uh, like 4,500 minutes. Nice. Thank you. Because I like literally I could see this going on for hours. I know. We'll, we'll try to stop it from doing that. Right. But it's, I just want you to speak to, you said it before, how we are living in a world, especially here in New York, right? In a world where it's all about productivity. Nobody's mm-hmm. stopping at all. And that's not exclusive to the secular world. That includes our Catholic church as well, right? Yeah. Our Catholic church, there are 500 different ministries with 500 different committees, which have a thousand subcommittees. <laughs> and all of us, again, all of us have a good goal, right? We, we right. all have one goal, but very few times are any of those ministries having a stop and just appreciate the beauty. So if you could yeah. speak to that a little, well, first I'll say thank you for, you know, being somebody who's trying to bring that beauty back into our world, but as well as our faith. But if you could speak to that a little bit of how, you know, the hustle of, of today's world, how people just need to actually just stop and, and, and take in the beauty a little bit. And I'm sure you have some stuff to say about that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it's so important to ask ourselves, like, when is the last time I've pondered something? Um, when is the last time that I've stopped and truly pondered? And um, yesterday I was driving from Philly to down here to Northern Virginia. And I found this old episode of Abiding Together podcast. Um, I'm sure a lot of women out there, Catholic women listen to it. Um, but it's sister Miriam James, um, Michelle Benzinger and Heather Kim, and they spoke about, they did an episode a couple years ago on beauty and I had never listened to it. So of course I found it and I said, this is absolutely what I listened to on my drive. Um, but yeah, they, they spoke about this so beautifully and they even mentioned it when we look at our like American churches and then we look at like European churches and obviously there's history that goes into the building of European churches, um, that makes them so beautiful. But, um, yeah, like when, when do we need to consider, yes, something might be less expensive. Yes. Something might be faster. Um, but does that always mean that it's better? Um, and I think I see a lot of current artists who are striving to make sacred art. Um, yeah, trying to share their art with the world, but in reality, like these things take time and like artists are, are worthy of their wage simultaneously. So it's very difficult, um, to address because obviously, uh, many places, the church is financially hurting, but then obviously beauty is important, um, at the same time. So, but all that to say, um, I think that it's very important for us as individual people, whether you be a lay person or, um, have a different vocation to like the priesthood or whatever it may be to ask ourselves, like, when was the last time I pondered something and how am I bringing beauty into my life? Um, for me, I am trying to prioritize, um, making space like in my home, um, for art that reminds me of God's presence for beauty. Um, or it might have to do with like taking the time for, to create yourself. Like, even if you're not, if you don't consider yourself an artist, um, to stop and like be creative with God or to just enjoy like good music to stop and slow down and truly ponder. Um, I think that, yeah, this is something where we can just like throw on the radio or throw on uh, like Spotify shuffle and it's just noise, like whether that be literal noise or visual noise. Um, maybe our phone background is like our to-do list. I don't know, but like to, to take, to be creative in taking opportunities to incorporate the transcendental because it is a transcendental that pierces the heart to incorporate beauty into our lives. Even if it takes an extra minute or um, you might need to purchase a work of art for your home, whatever it may be. Um, Yeah. I just encourage people to ponder um, 
yeah, I think it's very, very easy now to kind of lose sight of that. And a lot of people see like, okay, well, beauty, like obviously like truth and goodness, like need to happen in my parish. Like there must be truth and there must be goodness, but like beauty can be put on the back burner because it's not like a necessity. And it's like, well, like actually, um, if we're not experiencing beauty in the church, then we're going to try and find it somewhere else. And that's not going to be true beauty. So like, wow. it is a necessity. Um, it is important. Like, I mean, I don't want to get into it now, but like you think of like the number of people like viewing pornography every day, like what are we filling our minds with visually? Like, are we bringing true beauty into our life? And like, are we satisfying our craving for beauty through something that is true and good? Or are we like, like grabbing some like visual fast food to like keep going? I, yeah. So one thing that is just sticking out to me as you're talking is something you didn't necessarily say, but you said it without saying the word is sacrifice, I think is necessary mm. for beauty in a lot of ways from what you're saying. Like you used the example earlier of like, I'm going to have to take a year to study if I ever want to create something that's worthy of God. And it's like, mm. I, you know, like you said, like some people might want to just produce, produce, produce without taking a minute to reflect on what they're producing or how they're producing it because it's, expeditious and it's profitable, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you use the example of like these, you know, medieval to, you know, Gothic European churches versus the churches that we have in America. And God, if you don't take anything else out of this episode, please just never let us repeat the mistakes of like the sixties and the seventies, as far as church yeah. architecture goes. Um, because unfortunately we're stuck with that now, but to your point, like the sacrifice, like those European churches took like oftentimes hundreds of years to build and like all of the community members coming together and laboring to like cut the stone and put it in place and carve the carvings and, you know, build the altars and all these different things. Whereas it's like, all right, cool. We can throw up some drywall and some asbestos and it'll be done in like three weeks. And then we can hate ourselves for the next hundred years, you know, Um, (laughs) like that's the trade-off there. And then even something like you brought up like pornography, it's like, that's such a, like you, I love, I love that phrase of visual fast food. Like that's something that is like, I'm not willing to hold out for like, what's real. I'm just going to go ahead and yeah. consume this fake thing, My gosh, right yeah. now, you know, and yeah. you know, there's a sense of discipline and sacrifice that needs to come along with it. If you're actually going to be in a position to pursue what is actually that transcending beauty that you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Absolutely. And I, um, shout out to my new parish down here in Virginia, St. Ambrose. They are building a new church. They had like one of those round 70s churches. They tore it down. They're building a brand new church and it's going to be stunning. Um, but they just announced this past week that they, um, I'm not sure if it's going to take more time, but they are fundraising more to bring in a company that's going to do a lot of stenciling and yeah, just a lot of painting and beautiful artwork in the church um, to make it yeah, turn our gaze towards God. And I just love that. Like, and, and, you know, that goes back to like us, we are the church. Like, are we giving, like, are we tithing? Are we um, donating or like commissioning if we have the means and you know, that that's easier said than done, but like, I don't know. Um, I, I know of a parish in Louisiana. I saw that the parish came together to fundraise for um, an artist to to create a work of art of the patron of their parish. So it just, it takes sacrifice, like you said. And, um, oftentimes that can be, it's, it's not that simple, but it's important. And, um, yeah, yeah. Like you said, I hope, I hope we all move forward with beauty in mind and not the fast beauty of like what's trendy right now, but like lasting beauty. So, yeah. I love it because you know, every episode, I feel like we, there is some kind of theme of just like, stop and pray. You know, that's what we have to tell ourselves Mm -hmm. to do. Just stop and pray. But what I'm taking out of this episode is obviously prayer is super important, but maybe take out of this episode, stop and just take it all in. Like stop and and look around and, and I'll, I'll, I'll take your word, Lisi, stop and ponder. You know, what was it like? We, we, we might be praying, but are we actually pondering? And that's something that I definitely need to do in my day to day for sure. Um, so wanted to thank you for that. Um, first, first I'll say if, if you have any last thoughts, I would love to hear. And, uh, but second, where can everybody find, um, any art that you're putting out there? Sure. 
Wow. It's such an honor to be on this podcast. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for listening. Um, yeah. My, my Instagram is Elisa, E-L-I-S-A dot M dot Torres, T-O-R-R-E-S. It's not just my full name. Um, I believe on Facebook, you can find me there as well, but my website is also Elisa M Torres dot com. Um, I have a recent shop that opened on there with prints of a lot of my work, some originals, uh, like I said, some journals and, um, other good gifts for people. Hopefully, yeah. Beauty on a journal will help you set the tone for some prayer, um, or beauty in your home or whatever it might be. Um, or you can just email me, um, Elisa Torres art at gmail.com. So yeah, all those things are found on my website. Um, but yeah, just thank thank you. I'd love to hear from anyone who has like thoughts on what is beauty. Um, it's like my favorite question in the world. Feel free to message me or email me. I'd love to chat about it. If you're listening to this, now you're obligated to comment on one of our posts. About <laughs> beauty. So Lisa's going to be looking, so you better comment on it. There you go. There you go. Yeah. I mean, you say that you're honored. I, I mean, I think I could speak for Sean and I when like I got chilled chills multiple times speaking to you oh, because I, and uh, I've been you know, just reflecting as you speak as well, because I know, I know for a fact I could be stopping and taking in beauty much more. Um, and I think we're all victims of that fast food, of that visual fast food. And this is one of those topics too, that it's very rare that you actually talk to somebody that's really informed about it. So mm. I think like I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed having this conversation. Oh my gosh. Oh. Like it's wow. like, we, we have a lot to say. I think Sean and I speak too much sometimes to when we have guests no. on, uh, but, but with, with you, I mean, I just, I'm just happy to hear you talk and, and I would thank love you. to have you on again another day. So Lisey, thank you so Absolutely. much. Absolutely, Yeah. Anytime. Thank you guys. All right. Um, so again, I'm going to post everything in regards to uh, where you can find Lisey's art. Um, I'm going to, um, in our show notes, definitely check it out below. You'll find her Instagram, Facebook page, her website. Um, so definitely look at that there. Um, if you're watching the YouTube screen, uh, the, the YouTube feed, you probably already seen it already because I'm putting that at the bottom also. But again, thank you guys so much for downloading today's episode. Um, you can find all of our episodes on, at Just a Parishioner on Instagram, facebook.com slash Just a Parishioner. You can shoot us an email at weareparishioners at gmail.com. Again, new website, please check it out, www.justaparishioner.com. So please, please uh, check us out there. Uh, we're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube. Like, share, comment. Seriously, share with your friends and family. We would love to share Lisey's episode with more people. And know of our prayers for you. Please continue to pray for us along the way. I'm carrying up myself.